Okay, well, the clock is literally running in front of me here, so I'll kick things off uh, right away. I was asked to keep uh, the introductory remarks very short. I believe everyone has a, a biography of all the panelists in front of them. To my immediate left, uh, once again, uh, we have Marci Popolski uh, with the European External Action Service, and prior to that, he was a Polish diplomat. To his left, Mr. Ted Opitz, a uh, member of parliament from Etobicoke Centre for the Conservative Party of Canada, who's been very active uh, on the Ukraine issue, including as a, uh, an election observer uh, the past two elections. And to his uh, left, uh, Mark Garnell, the Liberal Member of Parliament for Westmount Ville Marie, who's also the Liberal Foreign Affairs Critic. So I think we'll start off with some inter introductory remarks, just moving down uh, the line on the panel, and then have a, I'll kick things off with a, a question or two, and then turn things over to the floor, all with an eye to wrapping this up in one hour. So with that, Mr. Popolsky. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, the consequences of the crisis, there are many, and some of them were, were mentioned. But where are we now uh, as the EU? Um, we just, uh, just held a, a summit with uh, Ukraine uh, last Monday in, in Kiev, the first summit for the new EU leadership, President of the European Council, President Tusk and President of the Commission, uh, President Juncker uh, and, uh, and President Poroshenko. And it just confirmed that you know, we are engaged in the uh, implementation of the association agreement. It may sound a bit technical, but when you think back, that was the reason for the Maidan events, where the Ukrainians decided to move ahead uh, to sign the agreement, uh, the free trade agreement and the association agreement with the European Union. That triggered a very heavy response by Russia. So the very fact that we are moving on is quite significant. So, um, of course, that comes with a heavy price, meaning when you want to put in place the provisions of the agreement, of the agreement it means a lot of reforms in particular in the, in the um, uh, economic area, and this is never easy. Uh, many of our own member states, including the one I know best, know it from our own experience. So, um, and at the same time, Ukrainians have to cope with the war in, in the East. Uh, so it's not, it's not obvious, but uh, we know, and they do know as well, that uh, war uh, as tough as it is, and as expensive as it is, is not an excuse to postpone the reforms because they are badly needed. And we are there to help. We are, we are providing a lot of ma macroeconomic assistance to, to Ukraine. That's the magnitude of 11 billion euros over several years. We do it in sync with the International Monetary Fund and other donors. Um, but what's, what I would like to, to underline is our work on common work with the Ukrainian partners on reforming the state institutions. The state is being challenged. Uh, some of the institutions are weak. There is the fight against corruption is ongoing. You need to reform the security sector. This is key, both civilian and military, and we are there uh, to help. And in a way, it is a very valid response to the challenge of hybrid war that what this was mentioned uh, in, the, in, 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 in many, I mean, the introductory uh, remarks. Because hybrid war is also information warfare. Hybrid war means targeting the vulnerability of a country, state institutions, infrastructure. So we need to engage and re-engage and, 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 and to do better. Practically, it means that well, we are working with the Ukrainians uh, on reforming the judiciary. The, uh, the prosecutor service, for example, badly needed. Uh, on reforming the constitution, on reforming the electoral uh, uh, legislation. And the most recent addition is work on policing. Well, let, let's say it's more than policing. It's civilian security sector, which means police, uh, justice, border guard, and to a certain extent, the newly established uh, national, uh, national guard. Uh, of course, it would not yield immediate results, but it's badly needed. Uh, and we have to do it now in order for the, for the results to become, uh, I mean, to, to, to be available in, in a couple of years from, uh, from now. The Ukrainians, I mean, the, the country has lost a lot of time. And when I go there, uh, many of the interlocutors refer to the Polish experience, saying that, you know, 25 years ago, 
Ukraine and Poland were roughly at the same level of development. Look, look where are you now? I mean, I'm there as an EU diplomat, but they know where I come from. Um, and they would like to catch up. Uh, so we have this experience. We have the experience of transformation. We know where the weaknesses are. We, meaning the EU as a whole, not only the Eastern Europeans, and we are there uh, uh, to help. But in the end, it's the economy, stupid. Hmm? And we know the country is badly affected. Well, it has a weak foundation, so uh, many reforms are overdue. It ha it's paying a very heavy price on the, I mean, on the, the war effort, obviously. Uh, but again, there is no time uh, to wait. Uh, on the other hand, we know that uh, people in, in Eastern Europe are famous for their endurance, but we should not exaggerate. The patients will run, will start running thin at some at some point. So uh, we need to, you know, focus our efforts, financial and otherwise, to help uh, to help them get a better life, uh, so that they can see that there is something in. I mean, it's not only pain and reform, but also uh, we can we can create more more jobs and, and uh, better trading opportunities. And that's very much the message of the um, free trade agreement that is going to enter into force. Uh, on January the 1st, 2016, we postponed it for some reasons. That was part of the deal in order to be able to agree on the Minsk terms of, uh, of um, uh, the ceasefire. But now it's, uh, um, I mean, there is no turning back. The trade agreement will enter into force, and I hope it will yield results. Final remark it's on the, uh, the, the need to communicate. I mean, we have a... A, a crisis situation, we have a war going on, and we have a propaganda machine running and, and being very aggressive. We need to counter that. I mean, we, the Europeans, the Canadians, the Americans, the Western community, we need to speak in very clear terms, call a spade a spade, and not yield to the propagandas trying to undermine our system of values and also sort of saying that, you know, everything is relative. Nothing is true and everything is possible. That's the title of a very interesting book recently published on uh, today's Russia, a book by Peter Pomerantsev. That's the end of the commercial break. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Opitz. Uh, thank you very much, David. And, uh, you know, we, we work in concert with our allies, and much of what uh, Mace just said is uh, very similar to, to what I'm going to say, because Canada is working very, very closely with the people of Ukraine. We've, uh, we've delivered a tremendous amount of money in just over the past year, uh, probably close to uh, $600 million in total if I added up. i got a whole fact sheet here, but I'm not going to read you off every number. Um, and, and it's fairly significant. There's a lot of loans to help develop that capacity, help develop their economy first and foremost, because it is very important to develop those structures and allow the, uh, them to rebuild a lot of their industry and, and to allow people to, uh, to, to start getting jobs. But they have, all, of course, multiple challenges. They have the war in the East and a lot of those institutions that we're, we're equally funding in terms of the judiciary. Uh, in fact, the minister, uh, both ministers uh, uh, foreign affairs with Ukraine and uh, Canada today announced uh, an uh, additional $14 million. And a lot of that is going to go to capacity building, to, to combating human trafficking. Uh, of women and children to, to helping to build uh, the construct for uh, a fair judiciary and helping to, to, to revitalize and reinvigorate uh, security institutions like the police and because people have lost faith and trust in many of those institutions. And, and, you, and, and you have to build the value system back into these things as well. And that's, and that's one of the things we're doing is uh, included in our... Um, military mission that, that's going to go to Ukraine. It's, uh, it's there to develop capacity in the Ukrainian army. It's there to help professionalize. It's, uh, I won't repeat all the things the minister said, uh, it, but it's also there in a, in a professional army, as we know, and I see a lot of uniformed people around. Um, as you know, good, good order and discipline also instills values and is reflective of the government and the nation uh, that you serve. And I know... Um, uh, Mark, uh, who's had long, long service in the, in, uh, in the Navy and, and then in space, and uh, myself in the infantry and other places know these things, that you have to build uh, fundamental um, core values within your own military. And that's one of the things uh, that we have done uh, within our own military. But Ukraine has uh, way more challenges than just the economy, obviously. They have, uh, you know, Mr. Putin, who is, uh, is the aggressor in Ukraine, uh, it's very clear that Ukrainian forces are in, are, uh, correct, correction, uh, Russian forces are in Ukraine 
and agitating. Uh, there's, there's a lot of reports that the Minsk II agreement has been violated numerous times, and particularly around uh, Mariupol. We're extremely concerned about that. You've, you've heard us uh, many, many times talking about this. Uh, the EU and NATO is very, very concerned. The information war, uh, the propaganda war, this is not really new. It sounds new, hybrid war, but it's been around a long time. In fact, it's, a lot of the elements of it have been around since the 1917 uh, Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, they've been refined. And the subversive nature of, uh, of this is, is a very complex, potent uh, variation of, of warfare. Uh, it's flexible, it's scalable, and that's what makes it very interesting with little green men in Crimea. I, I would submit, though, that that type of tactic will work in, in, uh, in an area like Crimea that had a lot of confusion, where you did have an established Russian base and you were able to leverage uh, local support at the time. I don't think that particular tactic of little green men uh, stepping into any other nation in the area is going to work as effectively anymore, but that's what hybrid war does. You, you're able to scale and change and move and, uh, and, and uh, adapt uh, to what you're uh, attempting to accomplish. Of course, the information and psychological operations that go along with that are, are intended to be subversive and to subvert uh, your target, and in fact, uh, even broader. I mean, we, we have a lot of that going on in Europe and in the United States, and we see that the information war is quite potent. It's, it's recognized by NATO, it's recognized by the EU, and, uh, and strategies are being developed to combat that. Um, and over time, over time, uh, it is not on Putin's side. You know, this, uh, uh, this will stall. We do work. In, and, and to Maciej's point about people, you know, traditionally in that area being very resilient, able to take a lot of punishment. Uh, you know, but we do have moved into the information uh, world and everything does move quickly. And, and I think people moved along with it. There's a certain impatience with coming when you don't get your information fast enough. And, and th these are all things that uh, are part and parcel of that. So this is a, a very uh, dangerous game. I think he's playing in an in, in in asymmetric uh, type of world. And, um, you know, it destabilizes global peace and security where it never really had to be. You know, people were existing in Europe, countries were existing in Europe just fine uh, until this came along and Mr. Putin had, had ambitions for other things, for Crimea and for, for, for other areas uh, in Europe. And, uh, and this is something that um, was a wake-up call to the EU and to, to NATO. You know, uh, Russia was invited along as part of the peace dividend. They were part of the G8. They were invited to all the economic summits. Uh, and, and there was prosperity, more or less, uh, being, being, uh, being applied across the board. And, and Ukraine, uh, all of a sudden, has, uh, has caused that to go in, in a different direction. Because why? Because they want uh, self-determination. They want freedom. They want democracy. They're tired of the corruption. They do look at their neighbors after the past 25 years, and the people have had enough. The Maidan, they call it the revolution of dignity because people have had enough. And think of where Ukraine has been, you know, 15, 16 months ago on a Maidan, to where they are today, Quite fr and, and holding off Russia. Quite frankly, amazing in terms of how quickly they were able to do this. I mean, there's still many, many challenges uh, that they have to deal with. But this is something that um, is, uh, is in their favor over the long term. I don't think uh, Vladimir Putin can, uh, can do that. And his information war, by the way, and his psychological operations are directed at his own people. Uh, many of the people in Russia are still dependent on TV, you know, less, less uh, the Internet, less radio and things like this. And, and the, shaping the information space is, is much easier for him there. And I would submit that the people of Russia are being victimized in that regard. Um, and, and, I, I have, and I want to add something very quickly. It's, uh, this is, uh, my, my issue in this comes with the governance of Russia and Mr. Putin and, and those that facilitate him. It's not about the Russian people. The Russian people are a big-hearted, big-souled, generous people. I mean, my father tells a story when he got out of the gulag and, uh, during the Second World War and tried to make his way to the Polish Second Corps in the south of Russia. These guys were about this thin and, uh, and were wearing literally rags. And it was the Russian people that took the clothes off their backs and put it on theirs. And it was the Russian people that pulled the food out of their baskets and gave it to them. They had nothing themselves in wartime Russia, but they shared. And he always remembers that story, and he always re recounts it to me. Um, uh, I'll just quickly summarize and, and turn over to Mark. On uh, you know, We're also working on, on civilian governance. We're working on 
helping them through the Federation of Community and Municipalities and other areas to develop governance at the local level, at the municipal level, because, you know, these things isn't always at the federal level. You have to build up your governments from, from, from villages and towns and, and cities. So a lot of that is going forward as well. So I'll, I'll end it there for now, David. Mr. Grano? Well, thank you very much, David. And uh, my two co-panelists have spoken very well, so I won't speak too much. But uh, in this particular instance, when we're talking about Ukraine, the position of the Liberal Party is in sync with the position of the government. And uh, indeed, I think all three parties are essentially on the same wavelength. Uh, for us, it boils down to the very simplest statement. Ukraine is a sovereign country. Ukraine's sovereignty has been violated, and only Ukraine has the right to chart its destiny. This is clearly not the case at the moment, and it is important for Canada to step forward. And history does not matter. History is irrelevant. Ukrainians want to turn towards the West, want to seek economic opportunity with the West. They are perfectly free to do so. And we, as Western countries, must demonstrate very clearly our support, whether it is through the sanction measures that have been taken, whether it's through the NATO reassurance mission, whether it is through the recent decision to provide training to Ukrainian soldiers in the Western part of the country. What measures Canada has taken in concert with many others, and it is important that we all stick together and continue to stick together and be ready to uh, uh, stick this one out because it may take quite a while. I believe that sanctions do work, but they do take time, and one has to continue ramping them up. I do believe that they are beginning to have an effect, but ultimately the message to Mr. Putin must be we are resolved to help our ally, our friend, Ukraine, chart its own destiny. And it's important that we don't blink in this effort. I think the uh, actions of the past year have uh, brought in a phased approach things to where they are today. Still, there are uh, many challenges ahead, certainly many challenges ahead, and uh, we have to continue to show that we're not going to back away. That's essentially, I think, what Canada must, along with its allies, send as a message to Russia. Thank you very much. Uh, to, to kick off the discussion, I was wondering if I can get you to, to broaden uh, the perspective a little bit beyond uh, Ukraine immediately. Because I think there's a lot of agreement about what's necessary and a lot of agreement about the steps forward in Ukraine specifically. To draw on some of the remarks that the minister made in, in his uh, talk, that there's a lot of concern beyond immediately the confines of, of Ukraine about events in Eastern Europe uh, and elsewhere, but particularly Eastern Europe. So I can just get all of your reaction to what else you see is necessary to reinforce the existing security architecture in Eastern Europe. The problem is that uh, the whole multilateral order has been challenged. In the Budapest Memorandum, the minister mentioned the Budapest Memorandum. You know, most of the people don't know what it was, but it was one a founding act of the Ukrainian independence, as a matter of fact. And it was brutally violated, alongside with other, with other provisions of the UN Charter and the, the OSCE, uh, uh, the Helsinki Charter, etc. We have to bear it in mind, meaning that we have to stick to the rules. We have to show to the others that we are sticking to the rules. And we have to build a broad church. I mean, look to other like-minded partners. That's why we are engaging with, with US, with Canada, with Norway, with Australia, with, with some Asian countries like South Korea. When we engaged, uh, I mean, when we decided, the European Union decided to impose sanctions on Russia, we knew that we, on, we can only be effective if we, if we create a coalition of the willing, which we did. The sanctions are biting. I mean, uh, it, it is quite obvious when you read the economic uh, uh, reports. So... Uh, this is about our values that are being challenged, and we have to defend them very clearly. No, I, and, uh, I obviously agree, agree with that. that. And um, where the Budapest Memorandum comes in, it, it created a lack of trust, not only amongst Ukrainians. We're going to be very, very cautious about entering into something similar in the future, because this was violated. It was supposed to be inviolable. 
and uh, and their borders were to be guaranteed. And clearly, uh, that's not the case. But you know, that does extend to, to other states in terms of of being able to trust uh, Russia's word. You know, if they're signing an agreement today, what's it going to mean ten years from now, twenty years from now? Uh, is it going to be cast in stone, or is it is it one of these hybrid, flexible documents uh, that can be manipulated for 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 other political purposes later on? I, I agree absolutely with Maciej. You know, in the in the in the world of uh, of statehood, I mean, your your word has to mean something. Otherwise, you can't deal um, with your uh, with your allied states and others. Um, you know, agreements must be respected and and followed in in order to be able to to carry on. And be able to have proper trade deals and, and defense deals and other things, but um, and that's part of op reassurance is to reassure our uh, our, our the Baltic states. They're they're posted in Poland right now in Drawsko Pomorski, and uh, and working uh, out of there, and 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 uh, not only working with uh, our Baltic allies, but of course there has been already some contact and work with uh, Ukrainian officers uh, and uh, to, to help build and train. Uh, through the multi uh, multinational brigade that they have Poland Lithuania and and Ukraine and some other mechanisms that are there but this this challenges all of Europe now this is clearly something that has seized everybody's uh, imagination and and if uh, you know this, Mr. Putin may have miscalculated he you know he kind of gave NATO a good shake by the shoulders and said okay we have, we have to relook at some of the fundamentals of our our collective security and uh, and that's happening right now and and NATO's moving faster uh, than you think the capacity of of Europe is is still very huge and i wouldn't overestimate uh, russia's ability there's a, there's a lot of cage rattling and uh, saber rattling going on and yes it is a large army and uh, or a military and he spends 4.5% of his gdp uh, in a in a failing economy the the uh, the, the rating agencies have rated uh, russia's economy literally as junk um, so I'm, I'm wondering how much of that ability or how much of that money is actually going to the people that need it right now and the rest is being funneled towards uh, towards arms and I'm not sure if that's uh, over time the Russian people are, are going to accept that uh, they're very very resilient but uh, to Maciej's earlier point uh, they may not be as resilient in, in the 21st century as uh, they may have been in the mid 20th uh, without wanting to repeat I, I would say that uh, yes there are some uh, countries in Europe that are nervous at this point, particularly some of the smaller countries, and uh, and Mr. Putin's uh, sort of speaking about the fact that he's there to protect Russian interests and Russians, as we know, in many cases uh, during the Soviet Union, uh, significant Russian migration occurred into some of these countries, and they're still there, and they're ethnically Russian, and he uh, may want to use that as an excuse to say, well, I'm really coming to defend the interests of of those who are in those countries, such as in the Donbass in Ukraine at the moment, because they really want to remain attached to Russia. So Ukraine is not the only example there. And that is why Ukraine is particularly important to prevent, if I can call it, mission creep from occurring in the years to come. We've seen in the past how Mr. Putin has extended uh, and, and created essentially buffer zones in places like Georgia, and he may have uh, other ambitions uh, in other parts of Europe. So Ukraine and how we deal with it is fundamentally important. Questions from the floor. Uh, there's a couple microphones circulating around. So if you could put your hand up and we'll allow the, uh, the organizers to bring the volume to you. And do want to note that Mr. Garneau has a, a prior engagement, so he's not just going to be stepping out to enjoy the nice weather. <laughs> Which, for those of you that are just uh, visiting Ottawa for the first time this year, this is yeah, like this all the time. No, I have to. Oh. Yes. Please. Nicolas Chapuis, Ambassador de France. Um, I would like to put to the panel two questions, and I'll begin with uh, Mr. Garneau's last remark, which I found quite interesting. Ukraine. The Ukraine situation today stems from a civil war followed by an aggression of Russia in support of the separatists. I just noticed that only Mr. Garneau spoke of Donbass. Uh, in history, we have seen that in Europe many times. Foreign powers supporting part of a European territory to advance their own interests. So it's not an external aggression war coming out of the air. 
there was a pretext, like in Georgia. So Ukraine is the second instance. And the worry that was expressed was, will it be possible to envision countries which are protected under Article 5 of the alliance? So the question is, do you make any difference between the countries, the EU countries, who are within NATO and countries who are not in NATO and have absolutely no perspective to be in NATO? like Ukraine. It seems to me that the discussion at the panel didn't make that very clear. The support we bring to Ukraine is not a support that we bring under the alliance. It is something else. First issue. And second, I was surprised that none of you have spoken about the Minsk agreement and the political solution at the end of the road. What is the solution? Is the solution to train the Ukrainian army to fight a Russian war? Or is the solution political? And if it is political, as we think it is, and I think as the EU thinks it is, it's not a military solution we are trying to find in Ukraine, then what is the political solution in your mind uh, uh, my question is, of course, more to the Canadians than the to, to the uh, EES. Thank you. Uh, well, you, you really addressed a number of things. Uh, yes, it would be uh, straightforward if uh, we could invoke Article 5 uh, and uh, Ukraine was a NATO country, which is not the case, so it's a more delicate and difficult uh, challenge, uh, but nevertheless, we need to be there uh, for the reasons that I've stated before, because uh, notwithstanding the history of the country, it is a sovereign country today, including Crimea, by the way, which, which doesn't get mentioned a great deal uh, lately, uh, with the exception of Sevastopol. Um, so uh, it, a different approach is required, and, uh, and uh, I think that... Uh, You've seen some manifestation of NATO through the, the reassurance mission uh, taking place. Um, but ultimately, I believe that the solution is a political solution. It has to be a political solution. And uh, I will say that up until now, Mr. Putin has not respected a single, not a single undertaking uh, that he has made. And uh, so... That makes it particularly challenging, but I still believe that the solution must be political. And I do differ from my, my conservative colleague on one point. I believe we need to keep the diplomatic door open. Uh, it's all very well for Canada, for our prime minister, to say, well, I'll shake your hand, but you need to get out of Ukraine, which I think made a lot of us feel good but it essentially marginalized us in, ter in terms of the diplomatic uh, effort here, notwithstanding the fact that so far that hasn't worked. But I praise Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande for at least continuing to go to the table, because at least they have the chance to be there. And I think that's important, and I think it's something that Canada should continue to include. But ultimately, when I say political, uh, I mean... Uh, coming to the point where we must make it unattractive enough uh, to Russia to say this is not worth continuing in Ukraine. And that means that ultimately, unfortunately, uh, it may have an impact on the Russian people themselves, uh, because I do believe that economic sanctions are ultimately going to do it. Uh, but we must be patient. They had, uh, an, as an example, a, a strong effect in Iran. It took a long time. I think ultimately that can happen. I think it has to be a political uh, solution in the end. And I think it's important not only for Ukraine, but for all of Europe. And, and I do, we do differ on that point. I think what the prime minister had said to uh, Vladimir Putin was the right thing to say. And most of the G20 leaders, I think, agreed because uh, they, they responded in, in their various ways uh, in kind. I would prefer, obviously we all would, would prefer a peaceful diplomatic uh, solution, but you can't negotiate with somebody who's using a propaganda war against you and everyone else. You can't trust anything they say. He's lied about Crimea. He's lied about Ukraine, um, and uh, and they refuse to uh, 
uh, to negotiate with anybody uh, effectively and and in good faith. So this is uh, this is the problem with Vladimir Putin. It's a problem of his own creation. He's isolating himself and Russia from the international community by his actions. And it, it is Russian troops and equipment in Ukraine. You know that Buk missile that shot down uh, the the airliner is not in the Ukrainian inventory. So where did that come from, right? And as far as the Minsk II agreement goes, it's not being followed. It's being violated all the time. And I got a buddy that's out there right now that, uh, that I talk to frequently, and I get reports uh, from him just in conversation of what's going on. In the, and I'm not going to tell you exactly where he is, but, uh, but, he, uh, but he tells me what's going on uh, over there and what, uh, what uh, access he's, he's allowed to have, not allowed to have, and, uh, and the violations of, uh, of the ceasefires. So um, if uh, Vladimir Putin wants uh, an effective diplomatic solution, then maybe he should step up to the table, knock off this propaganda war and this information war that he's waged against not only the Ukraine but the rest of the world, and, and start dealing as a statesman in an honest, transparent, and reliable manner. Well, you has put a lot of effort to support the implementation of the Minsk Agreement, and the Minsk Agreement was actually brokered by France and, and, and Germany. Uh, and we are all, I mean, all member states' institutions are fully be behind it. So um, still, our su support to the OEC, for example, to the monitoring mission that is there on the ground is, is a key priority. We've given them a lot of material support, not only political, but material, financial, logistical uh, support, so we want to, to make sure that they can, they can perform as good as they can. But problems persist. I mean, the, uh, the OSCE is not able to access some areas that are under control of separatists. Uh, the terms of the agreement are being violated. I mean, there are flare-ups of, of, of violence regularly. I mean, not every day, but, but very often, unfortunately. Uh, that's why the EU leaders, when they, got, uh, when they discussed it last time in March, made it very clear that the decision on the duration of the sanctions against Russia uh, is clearly linked to the full implementation of the Minsk Agreement, which is supposed to happen by the end of the year. Thank you. Eric? Um, thank you. Eric Morse from the Royal Canadian Military Institute. Um, my uh, affiliation will uh, attest that I'm nobody's economist. But um, I would like to ask the panel we mentioned uh, $11 billion uh, through IMF and EU in financial supports to Ukraine. To what extent is that simply being siphoned through to Moscow in terms of manipulation of energy debt? <laughs> Look, this is an overall figure, I mean, and, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's a mixture of loans and grants and, and loan guarantees. I mean, there is an issue, although you're very right uh, in pointing to that, that, that Ukraine is still very much dependent on Russian energy deliveries, I mean, gas, in the first place. Uh, so what, uh, what the EU has been doing, the European Commission, is to, um, again, mediate and help find a solution to the gas, I mean, to the continuity of gas deliveries. So for the time being, we have a solution in place which is temporary, so we still need to extend it in order to Ukraine to have enough, enough gas supplies for the next winter uh, at a reasonable price. So we invest quite a lot in, in that politically. So we sit there with them at the, t at the table with the Russians and the Ukrainians to make sure that they don't overpay, uh, which, is, which has been the case in, in the past. By the way, things have changed a little bit since last week when the European Commission announced the official launch of an anti-monopoly investigation against Gazprom. And this is something very, very meaningful. No, that's good. That's, uh, I can't add to that. Someone else? Over here. Please, uh, on the left, my left. I'm the Belgian ambassador. I have two questions to the panel. First, the notion of frozen conflict. I'll be happy to know what is the assessment or the view of the panel regarding 
a new frozen conflict on eastern Ukraine based on uh, three previous frozen conflicts which are not yet resolved in uh, the Caucasian and uh, Europe. And secondly, I'd like to also ask the panel to uh, reflect on the concept of hybrid warfare. How is the NATO and the EU able to cope with this new type of warfare called the hybrid warfare? Thank you. I'll start on the hybrid warfare. Uh, take your, that question first. Um, you know, we've, one thing you do in militaries is, is once you discover and, and see tactics and techniques and procedures and other things that are being applied uh, in other places, as, as is this, uh, you have a whole bunch of smart military people that are, are analyzing all these things in the headquarters. And, and they, uh, they do an analysis of its effectiveness in different quarters and how it's, how it's uh, impacting uh, the, the target, uh, which is primarily Ukraine right now, I guess. And, uh, and, of course, the wider uh, target. So if you're looking at uh, Russian media, Russian TV, and, and other forms of, uh, of uh, media, which is intended to influence and shape the thoughts of uh, people and, and countries externally to them, uh, this is something that, that's come to mind, come to bear. It's been talked about by General Breedlove uh, as well and, uh, and counter strategy. So these things work both ways. Right, it can. So uh, there's there's info ops and counter info ops. You know, psyops and counter psyops. And uh, so this is uh, what thing what armies and militaries do and develop those strategies and those expertise in those fields. So um, NATO is not devoid of these skills. They they have these skills. Uh, they're they're not, uh, you know, countering Russia in, in that way. But we do, I think, have to address. Uh, the bigger problem of the information warfare, which is intended to, to, to shape the battle space, if I could say it that way, and, and to influence, and to influence uh, the target audiences in various countries. Like, for example, you know, in, uh, in certain capitals, I mean, in the United States, in Canada, in, uh, in Europe, you know, you do have a lot of Russian speakers in other places. So what, what might you want to do? You may want to influence uh, those people that might be more receptive to you first and then, and then work on to secondary uh, Audiences, but um, but these things are being addressed. The strategies are being uh, formulated. I've been reading some some uh, preliminary papers on that right now, and uh, this is uh, this is something NATO is seized with uh, being able to 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 deal with. And on my, I start with frozen conflict. I mean, I hope that we can avoid it because unfortunately, frozen conflicts tend to last. We see it in Transnistria and. and uh, uh, Abkhazia and, and South Ossetia. Um, so once we get to that stage, it's very difficult to, to move away. Hence the importance of the political process. We need to negotiate and, and to find, a, to find a, a solution that would, that would be a lasting one, um, not only stop the, the fighting, but, but broker a political deal. And, and the Ukrainian government has made it very clear they are ready to engage in, 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 in a serious conversation about decentralization, which does not equal federalization of Ukraine, but decentralization, devolving of powers to certain, I mean, to the eastern regions. Um, so this, uh, this will still take some, some time, but I, I really hope that we can avoid a, a frozen conflict. On hybrid, I, I only to, to add to what Ted has said, um, because... The hybrid war is hybrid. It cannot be uh, uh, countered with military means alone. And then there is, there is a lot of space for complementarity between EU and NATO. I mean, uh, first of all, we need to share uh, intelligence, meaning situational awareness, to, to be able to, to spot those threats. And some of them are internal. I mean, when, when, when you know, we are faced with very aggressive propaganda, uh, it's not only the eastern flank or in Ukraine, it's also within, within Europe. Uh, we have to look at our own weaknesses, the vulnerabilities, uh, whether it's vulnerabilities uh, um, for cyber attacks, for example, or critical infrastructure. So um, we've been talking to our NATO colleagues uh, the technical level, um, um, and the member states of the European Union are very clear in their mind, and they want us to engage more because we, have to, we are in this together. Uh, so um, I, I hope that in the coming few months uh, we'll be able to develop some uh, very operational ideas how to go about it. Uh, another question in the middle? Uh, 
Thank you very much. I'm uh, Jean Sabit Carson from the Portuguese Embassy in Ottawa. Uh, uh, there were, during the, the previous speeches, there were mentioned the, the issue of uh, Arctic and the growing presence, military presence of, um, of Russia in the Arctic. So it's near the, the, well, the Canadian border. The United States is a completely different scenario. Do you think that uh, there are reasons for reevaluate re 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 the security situation in the Arctic? And um, do you think, or do, do you think the, yes, there is a change in this opening to the dialogue showed by Russia in the Arctic till now, that to differentiate the one thing will be the situation in Europe, I mean in Ukraine, and the Arctic will be uh, business as usual, not the cooperation, and uh, it will be also a channel of communication between with the, with the West. Thank you. Uh, it, you know, in the Arctic, I mean, there is a threat. You know, the Vladimir Putin has, is putting more bases in the Arctic, he's building up his fleet uh, in the Arctic. There's, there's been mothballed Cold War bases that are, they've dusted off and are now bringing back uh, online. So that's clearly an indication that, that he intends to, uh, to have a much greater military presence uh, in the Arctic. And we're all connected, not just Canada and, and the U.S. And, uh, and Russia, but obviously all the, all the nations uh, that form the Arctic Council. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we didn't evaluate that potential threat. I, I consider Vladimir Putin and what he's doing threatening to everybody, and, and intentionally so. It's not by accident. I mean, it's by design. And, you know, the, uh, the number of flights that are probing our airspace, not just our airspace, Baltic airspace and other nations, have, have grown exponentially. You know, we, we sent uh, Canadian CF-18s to the Baltic to, to help with the overflights and, and to, uh, to help patrol uh, their skies for, for a time. So these are things that, that we have to now realistically take stock of, take a look at, and, and do an evaluation of, of our own border security. And that's in the Arctic as well. We would be imprudent if we didn't. Mark? Yeah, I would say that... Uh, um, there's no question that uh, the Russian presence has increased up in, in the north. Uh, I think there's a great deal of posturing involved, and, and that old sort of old adage that if you're, if you're there, you can sort of almost uh, claim that uh, ownership of it. But I think ultimately the, the, the international courts will make the decision about who owns the Arctic, and as we all know, it is all based on, on how the continental shelves extend beyond the actual countries. And that, I think, ultimately, in the, in the if you like, the, the world court of opinion, will be the uh, best scientific basis for deciding who has valid claim to what part uh, of that Arctic. Now, if that's respected, we're home free. If it isn't, then that's a different proposition. But I think that that will be the basis on which, ultimately, uh, ownership of different parts of the Arctic will will be decided. I, I hope that uh, that process can go smoothly and that it will not be contested. Arctic matters for us as well. Uh, we are not an Arctic power, I mean, it, uh, but we are very much interested. I mean, there is a lot of potential economic in terms of transport routes. Um, uh, that's why uh, the EU is, is determined to become a permanent observer in the Arctic Council. And Federica Mogherini uh, has under, underlined that as, as one of her priorities in her confirmation hearing in the European Parliament. We are not there yet, because we still need support of all members of uh, the Arctic Council to become uh, the, uh, the permanent uh, observer, and one member uh, of the Arctic Council is still opposed to that. I think we have time for one or two more. Does it work? Okay. Yes. Um, Ala Bilevsky, Embassy of the Republic of Moldova, excuse me. <clears throat> um, uh, thank you so much for um, your very interesting insight on the uh, EU's and Canada's approach towards Ukraine. Um, I've been very carefully listening to what Minister Kenny uh, mentioned about um, um, the sensitivity of the Baltic states uh, towards um, the um, Russian aggression in Ukraine. And uh, I fully agree 
that this is a uh, um, a common concern. But um, my question would be, and in fact, it's kind of an appeal, particularly to the uh, uh, Canadian uh, representatives and uh, uh, to the panelists, and also to the representatives of the Canadian government uh, who are present here. Um, I am surprised that has, Moldova has never been mentioned in your uh, addresses, in your um, presentations. But Moldova is bordering Ukraine uh, to its um, western um, um, uh, frontier. And out of this uh, frontier, more than 400 kilometers uh, go to the uh, Transnistrian segment. And you rightly mentioned, uh, Mr. Popovsky, um, that this is a breakaway um, region of Moldova where the Russian troops are still stationed without the consent of the uh, Moldovan government. So my question would be uh, to the panelists uh, um, from uh, Canada. Do you think that Canada has been efficiently engaged with Moldova in assisting to address somehow its vulnerability first? And secondly, do you think that Canada could consider a possibility of extending some at least of these, its programs with Ukraine upon Moldova? Thank you. And before the two of you answer, I was relayed to me that your staff is uh, requesting your presence soon for a vote in the House, so I'll preface your uh, brief uh, answers to that to allow you to go exercise democracy. Um, yeah. You know, it's a good question. And, and you do have a, a, a very big advocate in, uh, in our caucus, and his name's Kornia Uchizu, who, who does mention you often. And, and uh, I apologize because, uh, you know, this is centered on Ukraine, and that's kind of where our focus was today in this panel. Um, but, um, but I'm going to refer that question, and I can't answer for my colleagues at Foreign Affairs and what contact that they've had at their level uh, at, uh, with Moldova, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to tread there because they'll, they'll be jumping me after, after I leave this panel. But definitely it's, uh, it's a question. This has come up in other discussions in other places. Transnistria is, is an issue, and, and especially where it's geographically located, you know, if, if there was to be an offensive or a push, uh, it would factor prominently. It's got, four, I think, uh, last count anyway, about 4,000 Russian troops uh, stationed within it, and, and it becomes a threat in that particular area. It becomes a strategic location for, for, for movement. So uh, with that said, um, the rest of your question I'm going to address to my, my, foreign, uh, my foreign affairs colleagues because I can't answer for the things that they may have spoken with you directly. It's uh, government to government. Yes, and I'll, I'll briefly say it, uh, the fact that I didn't mention Moldova today is not a, it's not a, because it uh, wasn't on the radar screen. Uh, we do talk about Moldova. It is one of the, I, I called it today, nervous countries uh, that uh, is in the mix of countries uh, in uh, Europe that are worried about, well, what if certain things happen in Ukraine? Are we next type of thing? So it's not that we, we do actually talk about uh, it and, and other countries uh, as well. So um, please don't take it as nobody is paying any attention to Moldova. Uh, in terms of uh, what, what could we do, that would have to be the, the subject of, of discussions. I'm, I'm not in the government at this particular point in time, I hope. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ted. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, we, we have our eyes on the world, but uh, we, have to get, uh, we have to get to a certain point first. Well, thank you very much. I get everyone to join me in thanking the panelists. And thank you very much to the organizers. I, know, I think you're going to need a bigger room next year if the growth keeps continuing on the trend you're on right now, but thank you very much for the invitation to me.